Chapter 2 I hurled myself along the road, thinking about the bailiffs and Devlin, who collected the rents for Lord Cunningham. They'd tear down the roof of the Neely house and pounded the beam until it splintered in over the hearth. Nothing would be left but dust and chunks of limestone and bits of thatch settling on the floor. Cat would be sobbing, her tiny face blotched and her mother rocking back and forth outside, both of them with nowhere to go. Devlin would never let them stay with another family. Lord Cunningham wants me to clear this land, he'd say, not add more faces to each house. I crossed our own field, seeing my sister Maggie drawing a picture on the wall of the house. Three-year-old Patch was dancing around her. Me, he was saying, it's my face. They didn't see me, and I didn't stop. What would I say to Anna, I wondered. My doll will be home soon, long before the rent is due, I'd tell her. We'll give you back the coin straight away, but right now we could save Cat and her mother. Even though the thought of knocking on her door dried my mouth and dampened my hands. But if she said yes, I could bring the coin to Cat and put it into her little fist. When she opened her hand, her mother would see it. I picked up my skirt and catter-cornered across Anna's field, one hand covering the stitch in my side. I could feel my fingers trembling. I went up the path then before I could change my mind, rapped hard on the door, and stepped back. Nothing happened. I leaned forward and knocked again. The door stayed shut. Where was Anna? Where had she gone? Was someone's baby being born in one of the far glens? From far away I heard the men shouting. I went out to the path to see if she was coming. Please come, Anna Donnelly, please. I turned and looked back at the thatch. The coin was right there. It was so close I could climb up and reach for it. And then the door opened. My hand flew to my mouth. I stepped back so frightened I hardly remembered why I was there. Anna stared at me with faded blue eyes, her head to one side. I opened my mouth, but I couldn't speak. She took a step outside, listening to the men shouting in the distance. They are putting the Neelys on the road. Her lips were puckered with deep lines around her mouth. Lend me a coin for them, I said in a rush. I will pay you. And how will you do that? My da will be back. He'll give it to you. I know he will. A louder sound in the distance. Was the house going under? Anna looked up, thinking, frowning. I will give you the coin, she said, but you will pay for it another way. What do you want? My lips felt strange as I said it. Work for me. Help me gather my weeds and dry them. I took another step back, suddenly shivering, holding my hands under my shawl, wanting to run, wanting to go to my own house and be safe. Go to Anna's house? Help Anna? I could hardly breathe. I will, I managed to say. She pointed to the roof with her cane. While she watched, I used a stool to climb. I reached into the thatch, feeling the thick straw dig into my skin under one of my nails, and there was the coin. I flew up the road, holding it so hard it made the ridges in my palm. A knot of people were gathered in front of Francie Mallon, my sister Maggie's beau, was sitting on a stone wall, his face dark with anger, staring at Devlin, the agent. In the house, only stone walls standing, dust still rising from where the thatched roof had been. Cat and her mother were gone. I pulled my shawl closer. Where are they? I asked a woman who was peering inside. I stood on tiptoes in back of her. The beam of the house had splintered as it fell. It lay in two great pieces on the floor. A rushed potato basket lay on its side, empty. "'Can I take the basket, sir?' the woman asked the bailiff. "'Where are they?' I pulled at her sleeve, pulled hard. She slapped at my hand. "'The basket, sir?' she called again. "'The Neelys,' I said, holding on to her sleeve. "'Gone.' She motioned over her shoulder with her thumb. "'Debtor's prison, maybe. They owed rent. Owed it for a long time. Someone said they'd be sent to Australia.' I looked at her, horrified. But that's where criminals go. I don't know, she said, her eye still on the basket. She turned away from me, half ducking inside to pick it up. Gone. Poor cat. Poor Mrs. Neely. I loosened my clenched hand and looked down. Anna's coin could go back into her thatch. I wouldn't have to go to her house. I wouldn't have to learn her secrets, her magic. I wouldn't have to see the she under the table. Just under my feet was something of cat's a small piece of yarn she had worn in her hair. I reached down to pick it up. Australia, I thought. I circled the house, passing the Neely's dog, a great black and white sheep dog without a name. She lay in front of the tree, tied to the trunk with a piece of rope. When she saw me, she lifted herself to her feet, her tail beginning to wag. 
I could see how thin she was, how easily you could count her ribs. Did she know she had been left there, that Cat and her mother would never come back for her? I swallowed, watching her sink down again when she realized I hadn't come to let her loose. Her eyes drooped as she rested her head on her paws. I tried not to think of what would happen to her. Then suddenly someone shouted, You! I looked back over my shoulder at the bailiff's angry face. I was more frightened than I had been of Anna Donnelly. I began to run and didn't stop until I reached the cliff road. Then, more slowly, I climbed it until I reached the top and sank down to lean my head against the cool rocks of St. Patrick's Well. A footstep in back of me. The bailiff? I jerked and opened my hand. The coin slid into the well and Cat's bit of yarn after it. For a moment, I could see the glint of the coin. And then it was gone. Down, down into water so deep that no one would ever find it. The yarn floated on top for a little longer before the water covered that, too. I turned. The Neely's dog stood there, the rope still around her neck, the frayed end trailing on the ground. My arms went around her as I sank down to unknot the, the rope. I rested my head on her matted fur, thinking. The bailiff hadn't called me. He had wanted the woman next to me in the basket. I had lost the coin, the precious coin, gone forever and I would have to go to Anna's. The dog's back was warm and her ears soft against my fingers. She whined a little and began to lick my face. At last I stood up. The dog wagged her tail the least bit. I sighed. Come, Maja, I said. We'll go home.